Hello, and welcome to the Knowledge Distillation podcast with me, Helen Byrne. In this episode, we're joined by Daniela Horak, who leads AI research at the BBC. Daniela tells us about the ways in which they're using AI, including transcribing the entire BBC archive, and about how she would like to see a bit more scientific rigor in the AI research space. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hi, Daniela. Thank you so much for joining us on the Knowledge Distillation podcast. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you, Helen? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. So um, I've been lucky to kind of meet you and interact and run into you at a number of AI events in, in London. And um, I'd love sort of to set the scene for everyone else. If you could tell us a bit of a brief background on your bio and, and what you've done leading up to and including your role now at the BBC. Yeah, well, at the moment, I'm a head of AI research in R&D at the BBC. Uh, and I wish I could say that my journey was like a straight line. Uh, my career journey, it was more like a Brownian motion. <laughs> I started uh, in a field of pure maths. I've done a PhD um, in computational algebraic topology and then did a two postdocs, gradually moving away from um, pure mathematics and uh, then ended up uh, with a kind of a short stint in a startup. This is almost like a rite of passage for everyone. <laughs> and um, I spent the chunk of my ML career, the, the, the major, like the biggest part in AIG. Uh, we had an AI team there, uh, Investments AI, that was our name. And um, everything I know I've learned there, <laughs> I mean, in terms of machine learning. And then um, last year, uh, in the summer, I moved to uh, to the BBC. I'd, I'd love to hear, I guess, about all the exciting things and ways that you are using AI at the BBC. I'm sure there's a huge plethora of, of, of applications there. Um, maybe to set the scene a bit, could you, could you tell us about um, what your remit looks like? So you're leading research AI, so I'm sure that's slightly different to actually kind of deploying AI uh, in different areas of AI. So what is your remit like in terms of how, how are you bringing AI to the BBC? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so in BBC, just going like one step back, we have uh, three AI ML data teams. So one is in R&D, we're doing research, and I'll tell you a little bit about like what we do afterwards. And then there is a data science team in products. So they are there to serve products. They are mainly dealing with the recommenders and the metadata. And then there is a data science team in the audiences. So they are in particular looking at the audience um, uh, data and doing a mix between data analytics and data science. Uh, in our team, we are primarily looking at the natural modalities of data. So not like a typical data analyst, data science uh, type of uh, work. So, and we're dealing with the state of the art models. So looking whether uh, we can utilize the new models, new technology that, uh, that is, you know, very recently published to some of the use cases that we have in the BBC. So we have uh, like uh, three verticals in my team, computer vision. So uh, in computer vision, they are looking at restoration and colorization of the old darker footage. Uh, most recently now we've started looking at some applications uh, uh, in AI safety, so looking at whether we can develop a watermark for the BBC video and um, image assets, visual assets. Uh, we're looking at the detection of deep fakes, um, and we're looking at the anonymization of uh, uh, using deep learning of people in some video programs. So you can imagine um, there are video programs that the BBC is um, uh, shooting that may require people to be anonymized, like uh, programs where you have witnesses and whatnot. And uh, at the moment, we are actually researching whether this could be done at the production grade level. Could could you see, just thinking aloud, could you see how this could develop in the future to a place where you don't even need the actor? Sorry to all the actors mm -hmm. that are worrying about losing. But no, but, um, cause, because you can actually just... Um, generate an AI generated replacement for the for, for the anonymous the, the person that might be anonymous. Like Synthesia is doing. Yeah. No, exactly. I mean, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, um, I don't know. Obviously, they are doing it already. Yeah. Uh, we are not in that business, I think. You know, I think also at the moment, it's quite difficult to kind of capture all of the micro movements in the synthetic avatar. So they do still look a little bit robotic. Uh, but, you know, we're looking at this very, very, very narrow domain, uh, such that it's more kind of visually pleasing for the audience to see a face instead of kind of a blurred uh, image. We're not kind of considering kind of general, more broader um, use cases. So that's the computer vision. Then we have um, some uh, activities in speech to text that I'm super excited about. So obviously when Whisper came out, we had a very long history of looking at the speech to text. Um, so back in 2016 uh, to 2017, we've transcribed the whole archive using the old systems, Caldi-based systems. Um, and now we've uh, started experimenting with Whisper and uh, fine-tuning it on British accents. Um, so we've got kind of squeezed out a little bit of performance um, uh, from that work, and then we are going to be soon deploying it. Wow. Wow. Um what are you I, I keep seeing whisper um distilled whisper faster whisper um all of these improved um more efficient versions of whisper that are coming out is that is that important for you for for your um for your use case to to um keep trying to eke out as much efficiency from these models or do you focus more on the accuracy or both? Absolutely. I think the, the primary reason that we've done uh, a Caldi, uh, Caldi uh, speech to text uh, to begin with is because we needed to transcribe the whole archive and it would have been millions in AWS like to use commercial grade systems. Uh, so it's like thousands, hundreds of thousands of hours of uh, audio uh, that we need to transcribe. So every percentage for us is, uh, is a big, uh, big, big gain, big win. Yeah. Um, did you see the the Whisper three Whisper V three um, that OpenAI dropped um, for their Dev Day uh, just last week? They've they've updated uh, the the Whisper Large uh, to a V three version, which is meant to be much much higher accuracy and yeah. Yeah, well, Whisper Whisper two was was pretty good to begin with, yeah. right? <laughs> we we've started looking at it and benchmarking it how how it performs. We were like, um, we actually started very early on that journey with Whisper and uh, integrated a lot of features like uh, speaker diarization We fixed the timestamps and whatnot, only to have OpenAI kind of release, <laughs> have a, another release later on and fix all of these um, issues. So I think this applies generally, not only like for um, speech to text, like Whisper technology. I think it's the same with like when you're trying to build NLP products. Like you always start with something and it's the easiest thing to do is to start with a low hanging fruit, right? Uh, but if you do that, then you're at a huge risk of having, you know, made your work unnecessary with the next release of, uh, um, with the next version of the GPT or the next release of features or whatnot. So um, it's, it's a kind of um, a very difficult uh, space to navigate for us, you know, for the people who are working in the field, but not not there, like in the top tech firms. Uh, it's very difficult to say, well, you know, what do I build now? <laughs> so that's vision, speech, and okay. then I guess... NLP. Yes. NLP, yeah. <laughs> Text. Yeah, um, yeah. You, you, do you split into three teams like that in different modalities? Your... Yeah, yeah, we try yeah. to do, although we're like a small team, we try to organize ourselves ourselves in a very modern way. So like we have these verticals and then when you have a project, sometimes this project kind of uh, um, encompasses many verticals. So so like you need people sometimes. So for example, the project that we're working at the mo on at the moment takes some people from computer vision, NLP and the engineering verticals. So so we try to do that. We were, we've been looking at some kind of the uh, building some PDF parser, uh, PowerPoint parser. So we needed a way to, to extract some of the artifacts uh, from, from these documents in a more kind of clever way. Than... Interesting. So another thing that I recall from the OpenAI Dev Day was they've just announced they also have uh, integrated a PDF parser with ChatGPT. Uh, so it makes it really easy to use. So 
a lot of the organizations that I speak to, they actually um, are not allowed to use these APIs from companies like OpenAI because they have security restrictions on sending their data to the third parties. So what's that like for you at the BBC? Do you have restrictions on using these? And, and does that mean you have to use more open source models? Yeah, well, that's that's actually a very good question. So we've spent like probably six to eight months waiting for to get the approval to use um, APIs of uh, OpenAI for research purposes. I think because it's so new uh, and especially for the organizations that are super risk averse and super worried, like you have to jump through through many, 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 many hoops and involve many people before you get the approvals, even for the like almost very low risk use cases and because you're the first one like you're paving that way for for everyone else in the organization it, it is really a very difficult and long process um yeah yeah it's it's definitely not easy obviously open source has its own um other issues i would say you know the commercial apis are good in that it they provide a better safety guardrails Whereas, you know, with the things like uh, Llama or, you know, MPTs or Mistral, you, you just don't have that. So, so if you're trying to use the open source models, do you have to kind of constantly keep up with them when a new one comes out? Someone tests it? Do you, do you, do you see what, how, it, how it works with your data? Obviously, you can't tell immediately once it's released actually how well it will perform with your use case with your data. So. Do you try and keep on top of that? Uh, well, I mean, not like we're not kind of tracking uh, the hugging face leaderboards uh, every day. Obviously, there are a couple of models out there and uh, a lot of variations. So we would normally, um, you know, a lot of big ones would, would uh, we would, we've uh, played around or tested Falcon, which wasn't, wasn't very good for our use case. We've looked at uh, Llama and that's about it. You know, Mistral. Obviously, you know, it, it was released um, uh, recently, I guess, and I thought that it was quite an um, um, interesting approach, in a sense, like they, they, they kind of posit that it's not only like with the scaling laws, it's not only uh, like the compute where you like you, for a fixed amount of compute, you have to optimize for uh, the number of tokens and, uh, and the size of the model. It's also the inference. So if like you're kind of building a model everyone else is going to use later on, maybe you should train it for a bit while longer to squeeze out the performance uh, to, to then later on, like have a better uh, inference quality. And, you know, with a smaller model, you can achieve so much more. Um, so definitely this is something, and this is, I think the Mosaic guys also have um, uh, kind of uh, also noticed as well. So, I mean, Definitely, we're we're still at the very beginning of this journey and are exploring our options, basically. But I thought, you know, going back to, you know, use of commercial APIs and integrating them in products, I thought that was an interesting anecdote, like that people nowadays are primarily kind of integrating um, these commercial APIs. And, you know, if you use a maybe um, um, not GPT 3.5, but GPT 4, you know, you're basically surfacing it as a free service somewhere and someone can just come and do their homework on on your kind of customer right. service chatbot or yeah. <laughs> or write an essay or, you know, uh, use it for other, other purposes, basically. So it's very difficult, like, because you're using, because for, for these purposes, I would imagine that, you know, using a smaller model that is dumber would be better than, you know, using a very powerful model and then having, having to build on, on top of it, like all of these guardrails that someone doesn't, doesn't really misuse it. So, so definitely, you know, we will be looking at these smaller models uh, from the point of view of like, well, you know, there are simply use cases for which it's easier to use a dumber model and maybe even safer, you know. I don't know. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. Um, I think on the size of the model, I feel like um, for a while, for, for until fairly recently, we were just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and there was just a very clear kind of push that for, to scale. 
um, and it worked very well. Um, but I have noticed just in the last three, six months, um, more and more hearing about models, they're sticking to the seven or the 30 B size models. Um, obviously the GPT 3.5 turbo, um, in the Microsoft paper a few weeks ago, they, they released, it was 20, I think, was it 20? I have to double check. 20 oh, really? That's yeah. a surprise for me. Wasn't it like 175 billion? Right. So, I, so everyone was, there was a kind of debate. Was this a leak or was it, um, was it a typo? Anyway, it, it, it's, a, it's a, well, it seems that it's just been very well distilled from the mm. 175 or whatever. So oh. I think they, yeah. So, 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 but then that's different. It's like, if it's des distillation, so, then yeah. You, you have to first train the large model, thing. right? Yeah, I think they're starting with a larger model, but the models that are actually being deployed are um, seemingly getting smaller or at least plateauing um, because it's just, uh, for now, I guess, compute costs, it's it's unattainable to, to deploy a trillion parameter, yeah. you know, hundreds of billion parameter model. Yeah, but um, it's not only that, it's also latency, reliability yeah. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether you can uh, get squeeze out the same performance, like you have these MPTs, 30 billion, right? But you kind of train it from scratch in that at, at that size. It would be interesting if someone could kind of compare or have the ability to compare, like training from scratch, the model of the same size, how much does it differ from the distilled model? Yeah, um, I think unfortunately at the yeah. moment there is a, a difference the the yeah. hugely over parameterized model somehow manages to distill down into a, a much more efficient smaller more powerful model mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um than if you trained it from scratch and that was kind of the the sort of part of the uh, kind of um incentive for the um the lottery tickets those papers that were years ago of well, if you if you can prune, so it's different to distill, but if you can prune the model down um, and still get the same performance at inference without w eliminating all of these weights um, for a much smaller model, can you train it from scratch as a, as a smaller model? But but it never really it, it never really took off. It never really worked properly as, as far. As so was the conclusion of that paper that you can't do that? Well, the conclusion of the paper was hopefully we can. Uh -huh. um, there was a number of follow-up papers where they tried, uh, and I think they managed in certain situations, uh, certain settings. Um, but but ultimately, it's it didn't really um, work out as a yeah. idea. But yeah, he's um, one of the the lead author on that paper. Is is the was the chief or is the chief scientist at Mosaic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep hearing about that paper, but I've never actually won. No, really <laughs> good, yeah. I mean, I think it, it was very interesting four years ago, uh, whenever it came out. It was the best It was the best paper at one of the, the big conferences. Um, I think it was ICLR. Um, it was super interesting, but I think, um, yeah. And it's also like I have issue with these papers at the moment. It's like a couple of years ago, it used to be, as is my, just my observation, it used to be like to publish the paper at the top conference, you actually have to include some maths. <laughs> oh, and right. people yeah. didn't like it. Like people just yeah. hated it. But nowadays with these large language models, like you run a set of experiments that are very constrained, like on a very narrow yeah. uh, space. And then you're basically saying, well, this is my conclusion, right? And it's almost like uh, similar to this parable about the blind man with an elephant. And then you just catch one one part of an elephant and say, hey, you know, the elephant is uh, long and thin, right? Uh, and then we all kind of jump on, on, on it because many of us don't actually have the possibilities to run uh, the experiments of that size. So without any proper hypothesis, without any proper theory, you're just bound like to sit there and read what's coming. And m many, many, many of these experiments are very narrow in their domain. They are not very comprehensive. And then you may end up thinking like that this is true for all the possible cases or that it kind of is a general rule when actually it's not, you know, it's like, um, I think that's the case for, unfortunately, for, for a lot of these papers. 
I, I do feel like more people are speaking up actually and and trying to 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 change this um, to get more robust experiments. Yeah, but it's it's not even that. I think what we are missing is like we are kind of doing it all wrong. I mean, I'm not I'm not like I don't criticize, but I'm just. The, uh, saying what I've uh, what I've seen, what I observed. So, for example, in other sciences, like you have a certain model, you have a certain hypothesis that you want to test. Like there is something that you're testing. You just don't go off and do experiments. Like it's almost like we are reducing AI to a level of like social sciences, almost like to the way how psychologists and uh, uh, social scientists and nutritionists are, are doing science, right? So like they go, they do a test, they kind of um, see a, bit, a lot of correlations and then they draw a conclusion. Whereas like we should look up to physicists who actually have a model, have a theory. <laughs> then they say, well, if this theory is true, then let's calculate some consequences and say, okay, well, if this theory is true and then these consequences have to be true, true then we have to go out and do experiments. And if the experiments support these consequences, then it means that the theory is probably true. <laughs> so I don't know. I just find it that um, we're still still early on um, in the in, in in this field. So I know that recommenders isn't in your within your team really anymore because it's uh, more on the product side now. Um, but I think it's quite an interesting area. It's quite a well established. Um, area of um, AI um, and it's where people uh, int that interact with the BBC will be interacting with the recommender system so with iPlayer um, or BBC Sounds I'm sure you have lots of media um, platforms where people interact with recommender systems so is there anything you could tell us about what um, what these models look like or um, the data that's used so is it uh, users watching uh, shows, uh, interacting, is, is that how you predict um, what they should watch next? Yeah, yeah, I think it's very interesting how BBC approaches uh, uh, their recommender system. So, so we have, uh, we have uh, the one uh, in iPlayer sounds and news at the moment, and uh, we are basically not allowed to use any socio-demographic data any location data, so nothing apart from the user behavior data. And only on the basis of your past behavior on the platform, you can kind of infer and give recommendations for uh, for what to watch going forward. Uh, but I think even that is kind of subject to some kind of business rules and editorial uh, rules that need to be followed. Uh, so I think... Yeah, at the moment, you know, uh, what you can achieve using that methodology, I think it is limited in a way. But I think that this field, the recommender systems field, is bound to be transformed in a major way, you know, by the large language models. And I think not many people out there are actually aware, but it's, uh, you know, it's going to completely transform uh, how, we, how we approach uh, building some of these algorithms. Um, what in yeah. what ways are the LLMs being used or starting to be used or potentially used with recommendation systems? Oh, it's just my thought. Like we yeah. in the we are obviously using traditional algorithms and are not, and as you said, yeah. not in my team anymore. But from the research point of view and what I see out there, uh, what others are doing, like in commercial. Um, uh, so I, I thought that the partnership between Klarna and OpenAI has been an interesting one. So basically, like they are gonna offer user experience in the future, where you could just go log into their platform and, you know, search for a product, um, like through a natural language. You know, for example, like my it's my son's sixteen year old son's uh, birthday next week. I want he likes you know football, sports, and doesn't like fashion and this. Can you recommend something? under 40 pounds that's deliverable tomorrow. I don't know, something like that. And that's that's obviously going to disrupt e-commerce for sure in a major way. And then you can kind of iterate through it. You know, you get a couple of products and then you say, oh, okay, you know, well, maybe not like this. It's just, uh, you know, he, he doesn't like this stuff, focus more on something else and whatnot. 
but the same is coming for recommenders, right? Like you log into Netflix. You know, like you're not anymore a passive uh, consumer of what is served to you. You're not anymore like an agent that can input like only one keyword to find the piece of content that um, that that uh, they want to watch. Like you can actually say what you want to watch. Like I feel like watching period drama this evening uh, with elements of this and that. Um, and this is just like one way, but, but they're like thousands of other ways that this technology can be used and then then of course the question is whether you need to have your content in the weights of your llm or you can use it in a rag type of way this type of kind of parsing so i think it's super exciting uh it would be interesting to see you know how the big players in the recommender system space like i think netflix is uh long been recognized as the leader and uh, having the best algorithm so let's let's see what they come up with you know it's definitely going to be like exciting couple of years in this space yeah it's interesting i um so there's the the recommendation of media which is obviously bbc netflix and then the kind of it, it feels to me like slightly different um kind of side of recommenders which is the e-commerce side mm -hmm. um so i know that meta um, when they published their DLRM paper, they said, and I, I, run, I remember speaking to one of their researchers about this, they said that Recommenders is so under-published about um, relative to the commercial application value of, of, of this area um, because people are... Um, organizations are developing their own systems and they want to keep them proprietary because they don't want to give away their secret source to others. But it sort of feels to me like the media side is different. Like the media, um, I guess with media recommendation, it's probably not as huge a um, commercial um, kind of implication on your business. So for Meta and for Amazon, I think that getting the recommendation right and wrong or whatever can can affect um very much the kind of revenue it has a very direct effect on on revenue and and people buy it whether they're going to buy their products i guess with media it's it certainly does have an impact and people you want to people to watch for longer and listen for longer but it's slightly less um important maybe to your to your business structure well, uh, I would I would agree with you, but maybe kind of add a couple of other reasons uh, why I think that's that's true. If if you're um, if you're a user logged into a platform and and you're kind of browsing through the catalog, and uh, I think there is a certain window that is much larger within which you're supposed to recommend not to lose not to lose that customer, not to lose that audience member. You know, after a certain point, they just give up and say, okay, there is nothing here to watch for me. I'm giving up. So this window is much larger. Like you are allowed to use maybe a slightly crappier algorithms, and and I also a lot a lot has to do with the content quality, right? So so you are not only a platform serving someone else's content and relying on p other people's creativity like Twitter, or Facebook, or Instagram. You basically also have to commission content and uh, serve it to people. So a lot of it is about like editorial decisions as well. So it's very difficult to kind of disentangle how much value is brought on the table by the recommenders and how much is it UX, like UX, UI, <laughs> how much is it uh, content and whatnot. But definitely, I think, you know, at one point, uh, people do kind of give up if you don't show them, um, uh, if you don't show them um, content items that might be interesting to them within that time window. So... Moving on from the sort of specific domains um, of the the various sort of applications that, that you use AI for at the BBC, um, a big topic of conversation at the moment is around um, responsible AI, um, including sort of explainability, transparency of the models that you're using. Um, I guess working at a publicly funded company like the BBC, this is probably even more important. Um, would you say that's true? And um, could you tell us if if you have any examples of kind of um, what what you have to do at, at the BBC in terms of using AI and ensuring it's it's uh, responsible? Um, do you have do you collaborate with other team members, for example? I don't know. 
uh, non-ML specialists or do you have to think about alignment of any model development? Anything along those lines? Absolutely. I, I think even uh, BBC had uh, first their uh, responsible AI and data team before it had data science teams. <laughs> so, uh, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding, but we were very early on on that journey. And that's, that's simply because we have such strict editorial guidelines, which permeate the whole um, the whole digital product portfolio and everything needs to be in accordance with these um, uh, guidelines. So the same, the same holds true for the, um, uh, for the technology we deploy as well. So we're very concerned with the bias. You know, what we see now with the large language model is that basically there is a political bias that is present in some of these models. Uh, and I think what one of the papers that came out in the ACL this, um, uh, this year was saying is that, well, if a certain type of political bias is uh, in the way, it's at the pre-training stage, it's very difficult to kind of get rid of it later on. Uh, so, uh, so again, that was like one set of experiments, uh, you know, that paper has come out with that conclusion, uh, but it's, uh, it's an interesting kind of um, a data point to keep in mind, uh, not to mention other, other biases that can be, you know, can be seen in the uh, in some of these models, especially recommender systems, you don't want to kind of put people in e eco chambers. You don't want to play this kind of attention economy game. So for us, it's uh, front and center. We actually have a, a very large uh, uh, responsible AI and data uh, team um, that I think comp that is uh, comparable to the size of our data teams is very, very significant. And they've developed like a set of guidelines and rules they call them mlab machine learning engine principles and they were published in i think 2018 or 19 so basically in theory every model that is produced it's almost like a checklist you have to go through this checklist and say uh, is there um a gender bias is there this bias is there so so a lot of these kind of questions um that that have been collected that we have to make sure that I, they are answered um yeah yeah, interesting. I remember the one of the things that came out of the Llama the Llama paper when they released Llama V2, which was I don't know, I can't remember how many pages it was. I didn't read the whole thing. I think it was eighty plus pages. Um, but they really they separated looking at um I'm gonna get this wrong now, but trust like um kind of correctness, shall we say, I can't remember what it was called, and safety. Um and interestingly, these two um kind of objectives can be very conflicting with each other. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really interesting area of, um, research and, and development and. But isn't it like, uh, to do, it's like helpfulness and safety, right? Yeah. So if you want it. to have a safe model, then you have to decline to follow certain instructions. And the more you right. decline, then the model is more incentivized to decline things that it should actually do. So it's a very difficult kind no, of... Uh, it's, it's, yeah. yeah. And it's I an think, interesting open question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, reading a Mistral paper in it, they kind of criticize, although they have a very, uh, like they only have like a self, um, a self um, a check in their model. So the only safety guidelines they have is like they give it back to the model and ask like whether I should answer this question or not. And they claim that their model is almost as equally safe as as Llama, and it doesn't kind of make um, um, it doesn't decline to follow through um, to do certain instructions uh, that may be you know plausible, like how to kill a Linux process. This would be answered by um, by Mistral model, but Llama would that decline basically. Although guys from Meta say that um, this has been debunked, but what we found is that definitely llama models don't have the full understanding of certain birds when used in in the certain context, and whether it's like because like they've over engineered their safety or whether it's they, the models are small to be able to recognize what this bird may mean in this context. I don't know really, but it's um it's an interesting um. I think the date to be had. <laughs> it's been, I, I could probably chat to you for two hours, to be honest. <laughs> I know. Like, I just have, I have lots, yeah, just, mm -hmm. just, just chat, which is great. Um, 
I guess maybe just to finish up, I'd love to know what are you really excited? So, so if you take your BBC hat off um, and just your AI enthusiast hat, what are you sort of, sort of most interested in and excited about, whether it's in research or news or whatever? Is there anything? Yeah, well, definitely. I, I, think, well, so, I, yeah, I think like how these the language models are going to transform the whole digital uh, ecosystem. I think that's going to be interesting to kind of see how it unfolds for sure. Um, I'm also kind of curious to, to what's going to happen to this kind of um, debate and what's going to happen to our field, actually, that's becoming kind of increasingly politicized, the existential risk debate. And uh, it was quite kind of almost sobering to see how all of this kind of unfolds in the public discourse, because uh, what we've seen is that like the way how I, at first I really enjoyed watching some of these debates, like between doomers and uh, tech optimists. Um, but what I think was missing is that they've been conducted in a completely unscientific manner. So like you would get a debate where you get two people to debate whether these models present the existential risk, but also at the same time, no one actually, they have in their minds different definitions, what existential risk means, and they are talking past each other. So this is the first one. So, so I think like we could have extracted so much more value from it. I'm super excited that the people from our field are kind of starting to think more philosophically. I think it's great. I think it's like, uh, it's almost like a characteristic of any field that is at the forefront. Uh, it's like we had philosophers of the 18th, 19th century being mathematicians, then moved into 20th to being physicists, and now it's like the engineers or um, machine learning engineers. So I think it's a natural, natural progression of, of things. But what I'd like to see is kind of some more structure, kind of including a little bit more of, of that rigor in, this, uh, in these debates. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, you know, of course, excited as as an ex person about what SOCNA is gonna launch next the next year, next month. Uh, you know, let's see where it goes um, uh, next. Uh, you know, it's equally exciting and frightening at the same time. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> totally agree. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Daniela. It's been so great to chat to you and hear your insights and your opinions and to hear about what you're up to at the BBC. So thank you. Um, I could talk to you for, for hours. I hope <laughs> I run into you again soon and we can catch up more. Definitely. Thank you, Helen. Such a pleasure to be a guest on your podcast. Good luck with it. I'm thank sure you're you. going to do brilliantly. Thanks to Daniela. I loved hearing about her experiences at the BBC. If you enjoyed listening, then please leave us a review and subscribe to the podcast. You can also watch us on YouTube. We are at Distillation Pod on all the main social media channels. So go follow us there if you want to find information on upcoming episodes. I hope you'll join us again soon.